Andre Lafoe. He's a technical specialist with Washington DOT Bridges and Structures Office with 35 years of experience, and he's going to be presenting on Washington State's polyester concrete activity. I am a relatively new acquisition at WashDOT, so I'm not going to claim to have institutional knowledge of the bridges I'm going to be talking about. But because I come from RE world, I certainly know what's involved. So what we thought we'd do when du Duane and I were talking about this was to share with you what we've done inception to date on concrete polyester overlays, just so that you can have an appreciation of what our journey's been so far with polyester overlays. So material characteristics, why we like in certain applications, the polyester overlay solution, depending upon the individual case that we look at. We like the fact that in three quarters of an inch, you can just about get, you can get a, as good a service life as you could with an inch and a half modified concrete. The compressive strength is about the same. Flexural is high. We like the wear. Our experience is that that 25 years seems to be accurate. A properly placed, emphasis on properly placed overlay will always be better than uh, nothing else. Cure time, this is important to us. This three to four hours is really is what bringing uh, polyester to the forefront for WashDOT. It's turning out that there's less of a tolerance for traffic closures the time it takes to close a lane. Institutions just don't like that. So, and chloride permeability is, uh, is, is good too. So there are constraints that you have to worry about with polyester concrete. Temperatures above 50, deck temperature less than 80, dry, no rain for 24 hours, wind doesn't seem to be a factor. Duane showed this graph earlier, and that 2% is important to us. I wanted to share that with you because what we have experienced in cases where that 2% kicks in, the decay, the rate of decay on the, on the deck can get bad. And this is a, just a bad example or an extreme example of what happens when, when that goes wrong. Um, obviously, the level of effort and expense for the repairs is increased. You have a high risk for full depth repair high risk for extended traffic closures. Full depth repairs require form work. It just goes south. I wanted to share this with you because it's important to us to have a good file, an accurate file, an up-to-date file on each bridge structure. And so what we have developed is this document that talks about the vital statistics on a bridge. In this case, it's the Samish River Bridge. It serves as a go-to document for anybody that's gonna be working on the bridge in the future of how that bridge got to the condition it was in and what we did to prescribe whatever rehab, repair, or rehabilitative action that we chose. So into concrete overlays. Washington State's Concrete Bridge Deck Management Program, Duane showed this slide earlier. We have 28 bridges, 833,000 square feet of surface area that are under the uh, polyester material. And we took a look at each project, we added up the contract cost, and we put together a composite price of what a square foot costs. And our experience is, is this $120 uh, figure seems to be reasonably accurate. It fits above the concrete overlay of $80, $80 per square foot. It's about 40% of what a deck replacement would be. So polyester concrete history summary. There's those 28 bridges again. The 833,000 square feet. The average age is 18 years, so we're getting good service life. Oldest is 30, I'm gonna talk about that one in a minute. The range was four to 30, that four is gonna to go to zero because this summer we're starting uh, one on the Toodle River. And we started this in 1989. Uh, eight of those bridges are greater than 25 years old. Of those eight bridges, we're over a half a million square feet on the good, on the fair scale. Uh, 17 bridges, 272,000 square feet on the good scale. Three are in poor conditions. I know where two of those are. I don't know where the third is. I'll have to figure that out. So here's the scatter chart. From 89 to 99, we show 
we, on State Route 18, where we did the first, the first application there, Holder Creek. But this picture kind of tells the, the backdrop of why we started using polyester. In Washington State, King, Pierce, and Snohomish counties are the high dense population areas. And when you start talking about having to do work on your roads, folks don't want to hear about extended prolonged road closures. And so even though we get excellent service life out of modified concrete overlays, there are some overlays out there that are in the 40 year range on the modified concrete but they take at least 42 hours to cure. And when you start telling jurisdictions those kinds of numbers, sometimes it doesn't set well. So you're kind of forced into the polyester three to four hour window, it makes it more manageable. Our first application in 89 was Holder Creek. And my understanding is at that time, Holder Creek was a two lane bridge, I don't believe this existed at the time, the southbound movement. It was considered a success, although it could have been better, from what I hear. After eight or nine years, there was some spalling and some repairs that had to happen on the deck. Over the 30-year lifespan, we look back and think that it was, it was uh, money well spent. We applied to polyester in 1989, so that's the 30 years. There's a picture of the repairs that were did, and that, that's at about the 10-year mark. In the last 20 years, it's, it's gotten you know, somewhat worse. Um, and right now, it's under contract to be rehabbed in the next year or two, from what I understand. Since 2000, 14 bridges, half of the 28, 504,000 square feet. You can see us starting to migrate away from the population area onto I-90, which is an important corridor for us, heading to Spokane and points east the same reasons we used it in the in the urban areas. Next up, this summer we're going to do the Tootle River Bridge. So we're going to be going to the southwest part of the state. The Tootle River is a tight arch bridge, about a little, little over 300 feet long. It was built in 1969, relatively high ADTs of 22,000 plus. BMS element 12, what we call 12, and 35 what we call the deck soffit. Something going on here, there should be some number here because we know that there's some delaminations in that deck based upon what we know the surface condition. And here's an existing picture of what it looks like right now. The north joint, the south joint, there's a panel section. In 1991, this bridge had a thin polymer applied to it. You can see the patching there. So we know that there's some delaminations, that there's additional things that uh, probably need to be done. The region did something we think is smart because we couldn't close the lanes down to get a good chain drag inspection on the deck. They went out and elected to do GPR testing and we've heard some very good presentations on what that can do for you in terms of information gathering and data collection. So. They had to get an idea before scoping this, what the clear cover of the deck was, how much material we had to take off from the deck. So you folks are used to seeing these kinds of documents. So what we did is we gathered the data, we, we mapped it, the engineer used this to scope the grinding depths and the narrative language of where to grind, how deep to grind, where, where not to grind uh, for scarification, and I say grind, I mean deck scarification, and then the further deck repair. This isn't going to uh, replace the chain drag inspection data that we're going to do. Once we get out there and the bridge is closed, we will map this with a chain drag, and likely we expect it to be reasonably close and perhaps find some other areas that needs attention. That's just a reminder. That's only about a year old, I believe. Duane, was that about a year ago? Something like that. This is, in, this is in central Washington. This is what happens when you lose track of your clear cover. We don't want that to happen. It's not a good, not a good day. Uh, once that happens, that it, it's, it's kind of like that, that through hole or that through deck deterioration when you start having to form from below. Things, things in terms of money, level of effort, they just go off the charts. So here's case number two. 12 years ago, 
we overlaid with uh, polyester concrete the northbound I-5 Seattle viaduct under a deck rehabilitation project. This was a heavy piece of work for us. This bridge is built in 66. It's 5,762 feet long. And for us, the 90,000 is a relatively high number uh, for ADT. It had extensive joint repair. This bridge was constructed with uh, this detail here that I'm showing you. We call it element 408 steel sliding plate. And they were gone. Long, they were past gone. We had been holding these things together for some time from what I hear. There was 1,800 lineal feet of joints that needed to be done during the outage of this work we did on this bridge. What the engineer came up with, and this joint seems to be working well for us. We're happy with, uh, from what I hear, the results. We reconfigured the embeds of the joint, put in new and, and, a new embed configuration. And you can see on this bridge, it coincided with a hinge. We tried to simplify it, recognizing that the best joint is no joint, but here we are, to where all you had to do was put in a backer rod and in this case, a rapid curing silicone filler, I believe. And so here's that joint, just short of the backing rod and the silicone filler. It rides well, I rode uh, across it just a little bit ago and uh, seems to be holding up well 12 years in. What was nice about that is that that material integrated real well with the, poly, with the polyester overlay on the rest of the deck. So kind of a unibody thing there. We liked it so well that the deck resurfacing and joint replacement for the southbound mu movement, which is uh, the one next door, this is the bridge we just got done looking at, we're going to do the same thing. So just some historical information. A lot of you folks already know this if you, have, if you use uh, the polyester product. For us, after about 10 years, we realized that we need to do some type of a surface treatment to open the polishing that happens to the aggregate back up. And we recognize that a section depth of 3 quarters of an inch might limit the cycles that you can do that with. And so I, re I realize that there are probably different scenarios you can uh, approach this with in terms of partial removal or full removal depending upon how many times you uh, you need to do that to get your skin for or your skid friction back and so for us one of the things we did this is actually the SR 99 tunnel north end of the SR 99 tunnel that just opened up a couple months ago just prior to opening the tunnel the deck in the tunnel is actually, a, it's a deck. There's a utility corridor that's eight or nine feet high below it. My understanding is, is that when they placed the modified concrete overlay over that deck, they used a roller skid, not a bidwell type of an arrangement, so that there was a unusually high gloss finish, if you will, on a lot of the surface area, a longitudinal tine surface area. So several weeks before the beginning of uh, the opening, of the tunnel, we elected to contact these folks here, which is, uh, some of you might be aware of them, they're a skid abrader out of Louisiana, I believe. And we asked them if they could kind of come up on a short fuse and take a look at doing some bead blasting on our deck, get that sheen away, and they did. So they came up, and 2.3 miles times four lanes, two lanes each direction, we were able to do that without difficulty, and we were happy with the results. This is, uh, this picture I think is when we were calibrating that first 20 feet to your left might seem a little bit excessive. I think we started dialing it in closer there. And so you can see that we kept the long line intact, the skip lines, et cetera. So we were able to resurface that deck in pretty short order. So the idea behind that is this might be one way where we can bundle polyester overlays that need surface treatment. It might be worth it. Uh, getting these guys up here to do that for you. I'll just say that we don't have any reason to believe we're not going to discontinue, that we'll discontinue the use of polyester. We like it when it comes into play with challenging traffic control projects. It's, it's very useful for us and we like the performance. The durability's been good. And generally speaking, beyond the first one, they have went well for us. So. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.